Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Farnborough International Air Show at this historic airfield about 30 miles southwest of London. One of the world's most important air shows with government, military, and industry leaders and aircraft from all around the world on this, the centenary year of the Royal Air Force, the world's first independent air force. Our coverage here is sponsored by Farnborough International and Leonardo DRS. And we're over here at the Textron stand, uh, Textron, who sponsors the Defense and Aerospace Business Report podcast every week is the president and CEO of Bell, Mitch Snyder. Mitch, it's always a pleasure seeing you. Thanks, uh, thanks for making time for us. That's no, great seeing you as well. Um, and, and you've been uh, busy as blazes, so I'm going to try to make uh, pack as much into this conversation uh, as, as we can before, you, before the hook comes out and you have okay. to go do your next uh, thing because you do have customers lined up in there. Um, bring us up to speed on V280. Uh, we had uh, part of our team down there uh, in Amarillo where you guys uh, did show off the airplane a little bit, uh, yeah. very pridefully, uh, I might add. Uh, but the development testing continues uh, on, your, on your prototype. Uh, talk to us a little bit about where you guys are on those flight tests uh, and what you're learning in this process as you as you continue to develop the airplane. Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. And, you know, we had our first flight in December of last year, and in less than five months we went to full conversion mode. So full airplane mode in that amount of time. So right now we're right in the testing. We continue to expand the envelope. And recently uh, we have achieved 190 knots uh, airspeed and uh, with gear down, which has been doing fantastic. We also have been really showing the agility of the aircraft. So uh, at the demo that you mentioned, we were actually pirouetting the aircraft uh, uh, down the runway, doing some high-speed jump takeoffs, and then, like I said, high-speed passes. So that's been really going well. We now have, we're approaching 40 hours, actually, of flight, as well as uh, 115 hours of just total runtime. And in fact, uh, last week, we actually uh, showed flapping. You know, our flapping is one of the big things for agility. And we've over uh, 14 degrees, actually 14.6 degrees of flap being texted on our, our run stand. So we've been really pushing the test points. Um, and and that, is, that is a lot of progress very, very quickly. Um, a lot of modern flight tests is actually validating your assumptions rather than doing the, you know, right, the flight tests are validating what all the assumptions you made. From an assumption standpoint, did you guys get it pretty right? Because normally the panic factor comes in, yeah. wait a minute, the flight tests are showing me something completely different from what the model said I should be seeing. Right, and I think it can be demonstrated what I just mentioned, the number of hours we've been flying. Usually if you, you know, predict something and then go fly it and you find that you're off of the predictions, you kind of slow down to say, okay, what's different than what our predictions were? The fact that you see us achieving so much rotor turn time and so much flight says it's matching up. What we thought the aircraft would do, it is doing it, and the predictions that we had on the flight of the model, you know, in the flight models is working out. There are supporters of the tilt rotor. There are the believers, the ones who have the religion on it. Yeah. Uh, I think you can't find a marine leader who doesn't think that's great. Uh, there's a small cadre of Army aviators who always wanted that kind of V-22 capability mm -hmm. uh, in the Army. Uh, but then there was a large part of the Army who was like, hey, look, a helicopter, you know, we need helicopters. We love helicopters. Um, and, but you have some Army aviators who are embedded over in Amarillo. Mm -hmm. And the more I talk to some Army aviators, the more they're sort of like, hey, you know, that, that thing is interesting. You guys have faced a big... Uh, intellectual, uh, certainly a marketing challenge. Uh, you know, there are some who would say an education challenge. How is that part of this going? Um, because what you guys are trying to do is not just introduce a new capability into the Army, yeah. but actually change the way the Army thinks about how it does its mission. Mm -hmm. A little bit about how um, you guys did with the Naval Aviation to replace the C-2. There's mm -hmm. a different way to do this mission. This airplane can actually fundamentally change the model of how you operate, right? Don't go hub and spoke to the carrier and then out to ships, mm -hmm. but move cargo independently there. How's that at re-education re or education or marketing, whatever you want to call it, how's that going? Well, I think it's going well too. And I think that's why, you know, I'll say one part of it was opening the Advanced Vertical Lift Center in Washington. So one of it was getting closer to the Pentagon and bringing in tool sets there that we can actually show off that capability. And so when you go into our center today, you know, you see a mission table that shows Here's how you would fly the mission with the current capability, and this is what you do when you fly it with the tilt rotor. So the kind of way you're able to fly, the ranges, the speeds that you're able to get there. And, and we also show the cost of that flight that you would see when you have to have forward every refueling point, stop, refuel, go again, and actually show that you actually would burn less total fuel on a mission with a tilt rotor than you would with the, the, the existing helicopter. So we're doing that. I think the other piece of it is really getting into the sim and understanding the flying. So the flight model, simulator model in, our Washington DC office is exactly the same as it is in the aircraft. So when you're flying the aircraft and you're flying that sim, you're seeing the same thing. It's getting them in, experience the mission table, understand that, get them in and see the aircraft, fly it, and understand that. The other thing to match that up, because a lot of people say, well, that's just a simulator. So the fact is we've had chief foreign officers flying from the Army, flying in the aircraft, and caught out and said, it flies just like the simulator. 
And that has been a quote of those, is it flies just like the simulator. The only thing it can't simulate is the tremendous acceleration of a tilt, or, tilt rotor when, the, when the, the blades start coming forward, how fast it goes. Um, and uh, hey, who doesn't like going fast? Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, that's my thing. No, but uh, in all seriousness. So analysts, though, are still, um, you know, I know you guys are working hard with the analytic community to try to bring them up. But I can't tell you how often we hear from analysts, from noted analysts, hey, we think it's a tremendous capability. It would be great to have a very, very fast Blackhawk. But ultimately, boy, it's just a flat, fast Blackhawk. And at a multiple of the cost of a regular Blackhawk, it's not work. It's not, uh, you know, that, that you guys could have a challenge. It's not that it's not yeah. worth it. There will be customers out there for it, yeah. uh, obviously. Um, you guys have said that you want to deliver this capability for the cost of a Blackhawk. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Richard Abeloff here uh, of the Teal Group, one of yep. the world's leading military uh, and civilian uh, aviation analysts. And, and that was sort of the point that he, he mirrored. Mm -hmm. Um, from your standpoint, I know that your focus has been innovate, 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 take cost out. Right. But there are those who say that, the, look, this is just a gigantic challenge to deliver that kind of performance for about an $18 million mm -hmm. cost, if I'm memory serves right, for uh, you know, an, an M model Blackhawk. Right. Um, that, how, how, what are some of the major muscle movements? Because that's not going to be trimming and shaving, it's rethinking how you guys do things. Right. How are you rethinking? how you're going to do things. Uh, I know you don't want to tell me everything that you guys are doing <laughs> in terms of being able to do that, but but it is, you're trying to make a step change in both yes. how you design, plan, think through the problem. Yes. What are some of the ways that you're going to get there? Because a lot of folks are saying, hey, look, this is a great idea. We're very we're, we're skeptical of they'll get there on price. Yeah, so I think it starts from the very beginning, and I truly believe that cost is designed in. It's at the very beginning, it's what the design is. And so our number one KPP when we started the V280, the number one KPP was cost. We said it's going to be hard for people to argue the speed and range and the capabilities of a tilt rotor, but one thing they always challenge us on is affordability in terms of not only acquisition costs, but cost per flight hour. So that was from the very beginning inherent in the design of the aircraft. And the thing that we used, and we started actually with this aircraft behind us, the 505, we did it with the 525, was our new digital threat and how we designed the aircraft. So being able to design an aircraft exactly how you're going to make it, that was a change. Usually you design an aircraft and then you go figure out how to build it later. We actually design in how you're going to make the aircraft. So that was different using the digital thread. The other thing is technology has changed, you know, since the tilt rotor, the first tilt rotor, the V-22 that we put in production. So, for example, the wing and how you design a wing. We designed it as a straight wing. And, and again, this made it very hard in the design phase, but instead of having, you know, dihedral forward swept wings, it's a straight wing. And all the ribs are the same. And so, for example, if you would take that technology that we used and do it on a V-22, you would take out 40 to 50% of the cost of a V-22 wing. And we did that same design process through the entire aircraft, always holding to the KPP of cost of how we would do it, where in the past you may make a performance trade. We've said the performance is there. Let's make the trade around cost. And then in the assembly of the aircraft, for example, in Emerald, we thought it would take us roughly 40 individuals to build the, the test aircraft. It, it, it took about a dozen. And so the learning curve is even different on how many people we needed to build the aircraft. So one thing that we wanted to do and show the Army through the process is, here's our design tools, here's the new technologies, and we actually measured and time, timed everything that we did, and we can prove that the cost is substantially less. We can prove it, and the Army's seen it, and they were with us through the whole process. Um, are, are you, uh, the, the model-based design methodology is changing how everybody does pretty much everything, right? I mean, if you go and talk to the Saab guys uh, about the, the Gripen and how quickly the first aircraft, you know, Hulkan Buska, uh, the, the Saab CEO, uh, mentioned to me that, you know, it's like prototype, he's like, it's actually not, it's, it's, it's actually kind of a production article is really what it right. is. We will learn things from it and iterate into the process, but it was startling that the airplane came together in something like five hours, right? right. I mean, when, when you do this right, it's kind of magic when it works right. out. Um, but what are some other um, innovation you're injecting in this because you know, you're going to have other challenges, uh, the customer's going to want different things, you may want to make a change in this, mm -hmm. uh, and so you're going to have to be constantly innovating, not just sort of saying like, hey, look, you know, we, we've gone on this plan and we, we think we've got it figured out. What are some of the other uh, you know, different ways of looking and addressing the problem, whether it's in uh, the design of the production line mm -hmm. uh, and, or other uh, supply chain uh, movements that you're making in order to be able to continually do this, uh, because this ties into a material cost question I've got yeah, for you, given yeah. the international uh, trade situation and you know ultimately like folks are not feeling the impact now a year or two into this they may be feeling actually a, a little bit more significant impact talk to us a little bit about that sort of continuous innovation process that you're working here right so I, I described how we were doing it right 
but that same digital design system will flow down into the supply chain, right? And so the time that it takes for them to design and implement. In fact, we had them on our teammates and I see them as our teammates in this process. So as the elements get designed and brought in, the hours required to, for them to design and build things and how it fits within our model has really been streamlined as well. So really what we've been doing, that element of it is really taking down the cost of labor all across the board, not only for ourselves, but we've pushed it down into our supply chain. So that's working. The other thing, of course, you know that is when you get to rate, you've got to get to just material costs being cheaper. But the one thing we've tried to do is modularize the aircraft, assemblies come together, and then when it gets in, the, you know, the big building blocks go together, and that's how you get the cost out of this aircraft. And the materials, then it's really just working with the supply chain, making sure that you've got the right materials flowing. But again, that's going to be kind of at a rate thing, right? When you get to a good rate, and you pick the right technology and materials, that's how you get the material costs lower with the labor costs to get the acquisition. The other thing I want to really impress on was the, uh, the flying costs. The other thing that's always been talked about is reliability and maintainability of the aircraft. And again, 400,000 flight hours on the V-22, we've learned how to really change the way we manage these aircraft in the field. And so that was also designed in with the, with the, the KPPs. So for example, you know, it may take a half a day or a day to change out of an engine in the V-22. Uh, the V-28 aircraft, we change it out in 10 minutes. So it's not only, you know, it's the maintenance man hour for flight hour and the cost per flight hour, it goes along with the whole acquisition total life cycle cost. So those are some of the other elements in innovation that we've been looking at to help bring that to the cost to bear. Um, and we were talking to Tom Enders yesterday and one of the things he said is like, look, data's always been key in terms of improving sustainability design in your products, but none more so now because you can capture so much data and so many different ways of using right. that data um, to try to uh, unlock secrets. Um, let, let me take you to the question, you know, we were talking material costs a little yeah. bit and I want to ask you that question now. We're in a, um, it looks like we may be headed to a broader, both transatlantic, trans-Pacific trade war, yeah. uh, depending on how things go. Folks want to avoid it. Uh, everybody understands where the president's coming from. On the other hand, you know, uh, governments around the world mm -hmm. see things potentially a little bit differently. Uh, from your standpoint, you're man in the middle in terms of, yeah. you know, you use steel and aluminum <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and composites and stuff right. that come from a global supply chain, uh, really. Yeah. Uh, and, and what allows you to be able to produce a helicopter as sophisticated as this and sell it for about a million dollars, which yeah. is a, a, a pretty good deal. If only I had a million dollars, Mitch. <laughs> uh, you know, alas, and, uh, and but your Bell Flight School no longer starts from <laughs> scratch and works us all the way up. No. Ah, I know, I wish I wish it was the olden days. I should have taken up one of your guys about 20 years ago on that, but I digress. Um, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the, you know, how are you thinking through this situation? How are you ensuring uh, supply lines? Yep. Um, it's going to increase cost probably. Uh, Tom uh, talked a little bit about stockpiling inventory. He said yeah. we don't do that. We do time to the minute in terms yep. of arrival of components, particularly at a factory like Toulouse. Yep. Uh, but he's like, you know, we're, we're looking at, we're going to protect ourselves, we're going to protect our customers, we're going to keep delivering. Yep. From that standpoint, that's the same thing you want to do. Right. What are some of the ways you're thinking about sort of safing yourself no matter, no matter how this thing plays out? Right, and again, maybe it's just the construct of the supply chain, right? So we've been following it just like all U.S. companies have been following it. And, you know, honestly, we've done a, a completely deep assessment of our supply chain. And at this point, we really haven't seen anything. And it may be just the way our supply chain is constructed. We are an international company, but the way our supply chain is functioning right now, we really haven't seen an impact and, and haven't seen one that's in the near future for us. Um, let me take you then to the question of uh, the Army's requirements. Uh, yeah. We're in a demonstration right now. The Army has rolled out uh, two sort of sets that it wants to see. One is the light attack helicopter, which presumably just about anything that's sitting on this ramp uh, could, could go after, and then, right. the, and then the medium lift. Do you think the Army's been clear enough about the requirements that it wants? I mean, uh, do, you, do you feel that this is the way the competition is structured, given it's so long-term and so amorphous in some respects, yeah. that they did it just to be broad and throw everybody in, and that you're competing for this with the hope that you'll win it, even though they may have something else in mind ultimately. Do you know what I mean? It's like, right. did they, are, they, are, they, are they structuring this with enough clarity that you know where they want to go and what is it they ultimately want to do so that your investment is actually very targeted to deliver what they want and that you're not just somehow a stalking horse in this or just sort of a, an interesting figure in this, in this sort of wider drama? So let me start with Cape Set 3. So I think if you go back and see what we did on Cape Set 3 on the JMRTD program, it started off with pretty broad requirements and they worked with industry and, we, and, and in that iteration of going between what their requirements are and what industry was able to provide, that's how we arrived at a V-280 and an SB-1, right? It's similar kind of carriage of troops, the, you know, the capabilities were there, two vehicles were being built. So I think the process the Army used on going through 
what we did with JMRTD to inform the future vertical lift for Cape Set 3 worked. And I think that's why you see two vehicles there. Now, if you refer to Cape Set 1, to me, we're back to where we were in 2013 with the Army. They start off with some broad requirements. They get industry feedback, start honing in of what the industry is able to provide, as well as what they believe their requirements are. And as we work through this process, I think we'll get there. So, yeah, we're definitely going to compete. We have some conceptual ideas of what we think Cape Set 1 ought to be, and we're feeding that back to them right now as we go through the BAAs, the draft BAAs, working, you know, we went through the industry day, and I'm working forward to see the BAA come out in September and see what our feedback did in terms of how does that show up in requirements in the BAA. But we're absolutely going to compete, and uh, I think it's just working through the same process that they did with Cape Set 3. Um, Pentagon has a new uh, organizational structure that uh, has been uh, being rolled out. Uh, I know you're uh, familiar with it. Uh, there's been a lot of focus over the last administration did it. Certainly this administration has grab it, grabbed the bits to sort of spur more rapid cycles. Yep. Um, what are you seeing from your standpoint as the CEO of an important company and, and military uh, supplier? Do you see a little bit more agility? Do you see a little bit more speed in terms of um, how the overall process is working? Well, I think right now it's kind of let's watch and see. I mean, I think they just announced this Futures Command. They're starting to get it staffed up. They picked their headquarters in uh, the great state of Texas, our home, our home state. So we'll have the Futures Command there. But I think, you know, they're, they're saying all the right things. You know, every time we meet with uh, the Army, it's we want to go fast. Uh, but I think now we've got to see it play out, right? I think if we start to see the, the system kick in gear, I think you can see it with what they said with Cape Set 1. They put out a pretty aggressive schedule, and, it, and you know, they followed it, put a draft BA out. We had an industry day like a week after uh, the, the draft BA came out, and they're talking about a, a real BA coming out in September. So I think they're spinning up and getting up to speed. I think, you know, in the past you haven't quite seen it, but I think we're seeing it now going forward, that they are willing to go fast. And what about from a DOD standpoint? you got Hondo Gertz over there uh, in, in the Navy, yep. uh, who's familiar with your product, yep. uh, being a special operator uh, executive. Yep. Uh, I know you, you have a relationship with him. Yes. Um, you know, are you, are you seeing just a general speeding up, or at this point, uh, of how the DOD does business overall, or is it still pretty much you know business as usual? No, I think you can start seeing. There's been some policies come out, the mid-tier policy from OSD. Mm -hmm. There's other policies coming out that says, let's go do some rapid prototyping. Let's go faster. Let's see if we can get some things. So as with anything, you know, it, it's got to get started and then play out. But I think the movement that we're seeing out of, out of the D.C. is, yes, they do want to go faster. I had meetings yesterday with uh, Secretary Gertz, and it was the same message. We're going to go faster. And uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, Secretary Mattis has put a premium on this, obviously, because of some very high-profile breaches uh, that we've seen, uh, sometimes not with the prime, but certainly from sub, uh, subcontractors, mm -hmm. in terms of much more ironclad cybersecurity protocols, not just for primes, but for supplier companies. Talk to us about what that means for you. I mean, obviously, it means a little bit more cost, uh, but as uh, Leanne Corrett and a couple of other people told me, hey, that's part of doing business is protecting your uh, intellectual property. Talk to us a little bit about how you guys or stepping up your game to satisfy his requirement. No, and it is, and we, you have to. It is, it is being in the game, and we have done it uh, you know, within our facilities to make sure our, our basic networks are protected. But the interesting thing is as you work towards the actual platform itself and making sure, because you are interfacing with the platform, as we move towards more autonomy, artificial intelligence, there's a lot more interaction between ground-based systems and flight systems that make them vulnerable. So we are definitely investing in making sure, not only are we cyber protecting just our basic systems where people are trying to maybe get your data and your drawings and those kind of things, but also making sure that the aircraft have multi-levels of, of cyber protection within them. Um, let me take you uh, two last questions before you get the hook and you gotta, okay. get, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta move on. Right. Um, one is, um, uh, let's talk about the commercial market, right? Sure. Five, 505, yep. uh, you've got uh, the 429 over there, you've got the 525, which is in flight test, which is why it's not here. Yep. Bob observes, <laughs> uh, observed to me, I was like, hey, where is it? And he's like, it's in flight test, yo, yo. I was like, ah, oh, okay, you have yeah. three of them in flight test. Hey, that's even better. Yeah. Um, what, where, how do you see this market evolving? You know, there are folks who are looking at oil and gas, they're seeing the price of oil going up. Yep. That's usually a good thing when it comes to making this investment. The last cycle around, you guys delivered, developed a beautiful helicopter and then the market fell out uh, right. from under your feet. Uh, that's obviously still a product line that's out there. We're, walk us through how you, you know, you guys put a huge amount of investment in an all new portfolio. Yep. Some of that is oil and gas exploration dependent. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how you see the market prospects evolving, say over the next five years. Okay, so right now I can tell you that, uh, you know, with introducing of this aircraft behind us, the 505, it has been doing fantastic. In fact, you know, we went with the big news of the show was we delivered our 100th aircraft in a very short period of time. And so we are ramping that up. 
So our light side of the business, which is our 505 and our 407s, and to some degree our light twin, the 429 over here, uh, you know, we're pretty much sold out this year, and, and some of these are actually almost sold out all of next year. So the light response has been fantastic in the market. You know, as you move to the bigger, the bigger aircraft, which is the 525, you know, you know, timing maybe just have worked out for us. You're right, the oil prices are finally starting to come back. But even with that coming back, the energy's still down because there were so many helicopters built in that previous time, they've been stored. And so they're trying to put them back to work. So there's a kind of a glut out there. Right. So, so what we're watching is, you know, of course, we're going to get our certified next year and then try and move into that market. Now, the interesting thing, yeah, you know, we did design that for the oil and gas, but we're also having tremendous interest, not only from the oil and gas community as it, as it comes out, but also the search and rescue side of the business is really interested to the speed and the range of the aircraft, as well as, as uh, the IP type uh, has seen response too. But we're really extremely getting, you know, as we get closer to certification, which it is next year, we are really starting to see the oil and gas talking to us as well as search and rescue. So we believe we got a, a good start for the market when it comes out in 2020 in uh, production. And uh, last uh, last trade uh, or relationships question, there is a concern about a transatlantic uh, rift yep. uh, that, uh, you know, when America first, America is going to go one way, frustrated allies will go their way. Yep. Uh, they'll spend more money, but they'll spend it at home. Um, you guys, um, oh, and there's one other question I have to ask you about okay. Yankee. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you about Yankee and Zulu first okay. before I get to that question. Uh, uh, Romania, someplace yep. you've been having a lot of conversations. I think you just got back from uh, Romania, Romania, if yep. I'm if I'm uh, correct. Uh, wh where do you see those two aircraft going? Pakistan uh, was obviously interested in the Zulu. Mm -hmm. uh, we're waiting for deliveries on that. I think we're it was like delivering two them. you are delivering them. We're delivering. We're storing them in Amarillo right now. Okay. You know, so we've we delivered three of them so far. In fact, I think a fourth just delivered. So we will deliver the entire 12 aircraft this year, and we have them in storage and waiting on uh, United States. Air, of course, it's an FMS case, so right. we do need to fit them to the, the United States government, and we have them for them. And uh, so those aircraft are done. Uh, very soon, uh, Bahrain. Uh, we're waiting, you know, we've offered an LOA to them, right. so hopefully we'll be hearing back from them soon on that one. And then, uh, like you mentioned, Romania, you, you know, our, our priority in Europe has been in Romania. It has been for a while, and so I was down there, of course, they're talking about uh, a 45 aircraft by 24 Zulus, 21 Yankees. Uh, we want to work with them on some co-production type activity at IR Brasov, and so that's going extremely well. They've asked for pricing availability. We have provided that, and uh, the next step in that would be an LOR for LOA. And any other, uh, what other markets should we be looking at for that legendary airplane? So we're also, you know, looking in the Asia Pacific. We've got some interest out of there as well as um, other countries in, I would say, the Middle East and uh, Northern Africa. Um, let me, uh, last question. Um, there is a, a transatlantic rift. There is a lot of concerns about, you know, where an America first policy, uh, a trade war on top of it. Yep. Then folks in Europe saying, hey, we've got to go our own way. We're spending more money. We should spend it at home. As uh, the CEO of a company that does business all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, do you see that impacting your business uh, in any way? Are you posturing and positioning yourself differently, whether it's on a, uh, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, you're, you don't get caught in the middle uh, because some of these orders are politically very, very sensitive. Uh, and politics can make the difference whether they go with one country or another country. It's tended to favor the United States for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some who are concerned that it may not going forward from the standpoint of a CEO. How are you indemnifying the company uh, for, or, or what can you do yeah. to indemnify the company? Okay, well, I, you know, as anything goes, we're all watching this with great interest. But the, to me, it's always about relationships and, and longstanding relationships. And they go through different administrations over those years. In uh, fact, you may, we do talk about Romania. We actually started working with Romania in the mid-90s. So the relationship with Romania, that, yeah, the Romania is, it's been going on for since then. Uh, Bahrain had started in, in uh, 2011. And here we're talking now about potentially having the LOR for LOA in Bahrain. And so how many administrations did that cover? So, you know, these things come and go. Uh, we're watching with interest to see how this one plays out. But to me, it's always about, and my message to all of our, our company execs and, and our employees is, we just keep the relationships going. Those have been longstanding relationships. We're going to continue to work with our European partners and NATO allies. And, and our role in this is to making sure, you know, if they want to interoperate with the United States forces and have the same kind of equipment, we're here to support them. You were talking about innovation getting to these products. And, yeah. and so one of the things I want to ask you is, you know, you're working a lot of um, other innovative ideas. Air Taxi is one of those things uh, that's uh, potentially game changing. Folks right now look at it and they go, OK, this is a little bit far fetched, yeah. especially, you know, when you guys talk about doing it in all electric fashion. Uh, obviously, you know, we've, we've got drones that we can do in an electric, uh, all electric, and they might be able to pick up the body weight of a couple of people, but it's not something that you want to hop on top 
top of and have it <laughs> have it move you around, and, and then you've got to recharge them and, and all of that. But right. when you when you how how are you looking at vertical transportation systems effectively? Um, you know, and how do you address analysts that look at some of this stuff and say, hey, look, come on, it's it's far fetched, it's a science project. Why is it not a science project from your perspective? Why is it a good investment of the company's resources to look at those sort of hybrid electric propulsion and vertical lift technologies? Okay, because I think, you know, everybody seems to want to talk about the latest, which is Uber Elevate and Air Taxis, and that seems to be where the buzz is, right? But there's, what we like to look at it is on-demand mobility. And on-demand mobility could be moving people, or it can be moving logistics. You know, honestly, and we believe, you know, we'll see which one plays out first, but we believe the on-demand mobility of logistics is something that may play out quicker. And in fact, I can tell you we're getting tremendous interest from logistics companies of how much could you move, how far could you move it, how fast could you move it. When you're trying to get to a customer that wants something that day, that second, you know, that I've decided I want to buy it, I want it here. And so in the past, they've tried to figure out how do you deliver that as quickly as possible. And so some of this is moving between warehousing. How can I quickly, if it's on one side of a city and we need it on the other side of the city, how can you have unmanned vehicles move there? Also, if you look at the military side, they've been wanting to say, how do I can have logistics movers running around the clock at night? So what we've been trying to do is, okay, say there's a demand there on the logistics side, there's a demand on the movement of people side, and really everybody wants something quiet, right? Safe and quiet. And so my belief is we're investing in this hybrid electric technology. You know, we were the first uh, roadcraft company at the consumer electronics the display last year, even right, got one absolutely. of the newcomers, moved to South by Southwest, and again, my message is we are a technology company redefining flight, and if you look at what we're investing in this side of the business, I'm investing in an on-demand on mobility vehicle that can serve multi-purposes, and so we're very excited about investing in this technology, and we believe it's got to be hybrid electric first. You know, the, the battery storage devices currently available today won't quite get it as far as we want to go with it, so we're going to start off with the turbine with the electric, but again, the devices that make it fly now are not transmissions and drive shafts, it's electric motors. And the fly-by-wire systems are there. So that eventually when the storage devices do get there, you can pull the turbine engine out and just fly total electric. But we believe there's, there's ability to do that and we're going to build an aircraft and have it flying in the early 20s. And, and you guys also have a growth roadmap for it, right? So talk to us about Gen 1 and where you expect and you want the technology and the payload uh, and the capacity and the range to go. Right, and so of course we got a couple vehicles. One of them I mentioned was, uh, that we've already been flying, is called the automated uh, pod transport, which is a smaller one that moves five pounds up to a thousand pounds, right? Uh, the bigger vehicle that we're working on is really in the thousand pounds. And what I want to do is quickly go to market. So we're working on one that's going to be the demonstrator, if you will, that flies in the early 20s. But in parallel with that, we're actually designing the real aircraft, that we want to be either an, uh, an air taxi, or and or a logistics mover. But tremendously interesting we've had is this first demo aircraft, we actually have logistics companies talking to us about, could that actually do the movement itself? We do have a spiral upgrade. We do have it designed. If you think about it, if we get the certification done on the fly-by-wire with the, the hybrid, the turbine electric, if all that works and the architecture works and it's certified, just by removing the engine and putting the batteries in, you pretty much are just recertifying it with just the battery. So we have a, a, a spiral program that shows how we're going to move from hybrid electric to full electric, and not only what vehicle we have right now and what that next vehicle is going to look like. Mitch Steiner, President and CEO of Bell. Sir, thanks very, very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for it's all the time. It's always great talking to you, Vago. Take care. Thanks. thanks.